science enthusiasts, my name is Jason Zakowski. I'm a high school chemistry teacher and a science communicator, but I'm also the dog dad of Bunsen and Beaker, the science dogs on social media. If you love science and you love pets, you've come to the right place. Put on your lab coat, put on your safety glasses, and hold on to your tail. This is the Science Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Science Podcast. We hope you're happy and healthy out there. It's almost Halloween. <laughs> the spookiest time of the year. Actually, it's, it's, it's a fun time. We get to dress the dogs up and come up with different costumes for them. Um, there were costumes this year or astronauts uh, or astro pups or pupstronauts or dogstronauts. I'm not sure. Uh, we got some shots of them in that. I know Adam's excited. He's going as a couple's costume with his girlfriend. Um, Chris is doing some kind of school related thing with her colleagues. And I don't know what I'm going to be for Halloween. I might just rock the Mandalorian again. All right, what's on the show this week? In science news, we're going to take a look at a gene that the survivors way back when of the Black Death had that is contributing to issues today. In pet science, we're going to look at a study that found dogs can smell stress. Our guest and ask an expert is material science engineer, Dr. Derek Miller. We are going to talk about LEDs and lab coats. It is such a cool discussion. Hey dogs, I was saying out loud 75 watts, 60 watts, 100 watts. And Chris asked, what are you doing? And I said, oh, just a little bit of light reading. (laughs) Okay, on with the show. There's no time like science time. This week in science news, this is exciting. I get to talk about the Black Death. Now, I have been my entire life fascinated, absolutely fascinated with medieval Europe and the Dark Ages and castles, and battles, <laughs> um, and plagues. Uh, I love that. I can't get enough of historical fiction or reading um, tales of woe from that time. And that's this this article caught my eye. Apparently, apparently, some of the Europeans who survived the Black Death way back when, which had a horrific uh, mortality rate, gave, you know, this one, this gene gave them an an advantage. But today, the ancestors of these Europeans contributes to a disease. So Europe wasn't as populated back in in medieval times during the, the Black Death as it is today. And it was estimated the Black Death killed 25 million people. That's roughly one third of every single person that lived on the continent. Now for, I'm not saying COVID isn't bad. The COVID has been terrible and everybody knows somebody that has been affected by COVID, got very, very sick with long COVID or even died. Um, As of right now, uh, about six and a half million people have died of COVID and that's worldwide. The Black Death, it's hard to pinpoint when it happened. It just kind of happened for a while. The peak The time when it was the worst was from 1347 to 1351. So this is a long time ago. Before we get a little too ahead of ourselves, just one more terrible thing about the Black Death. If you were infected, 60% of the people that were infected died. And I guess it's with morbid curiosity. I love reading stories of this time. Um, maybe it's a little macabre, but just how you can imagine if it, everybody who got sick, 60% of them didn't make it, or one third of a town just died. The Black Death was caused by a bacteria, Yersinia pestis. Now, in this study, population geneticist Louis Bariolo and his team were looking at one specific area. Parts of the genes that would be related to your immune system, but also potentially have autoimmune or inflammatory issues. So like you have this gene, it helps out your immune system in some some instances, but it could hurt you in others. And his team looked at the remains of a whole bunch of people, over 500 people who um, died 
in, were buried in London and Denmark between 1,000 and 1,800, and also included in this list people who died during the Black Death. So they were looking for genes before, genes during, genes after, to see if there was any evolutionary pressure on the genetic structure after the Black Death. And very interestingly, they found some stuff. Chromosomes that gave people uh, an advantage called ERAP2. Um, basically, if you were infected with Black Death, they, that Y pestis bacteria, um, the immune cells were just a little bit more effective at killing the bacteria. That ERAP2 um, was found to be higher in people after the Black Death. But it also contributes to a disease today called Crohn's disease. The calculated chance that you'd survive the Black Death, bet, like the better odds of surviving the Black Death if you had this gene, was not insignificant. It was an additional uh, 40%. I guess when they look at the DNA, it doesn't cause Crohn's disease, but this ERAP2 can um, increase your likelihood of getting Crohn's. So there was something about this gene that gave people a better fighting chance back in the day, but folks with Crohn's disease may be paying for it in today's, t today's day. It's not that much of a stretch of the imagination when you think that somebody with a hyperactive immune system that was really good at fighting off something deadly, you know, a, a disadvantage of that is your immune system could turn on your own body, which is sort of how Crohn's disease operates. It's fascinating because you think that humans are really done evolving, but if there's enough selective pressure, any biological system will go through evolution. You, if you are fitted the best for your environment, you get to survive and pass on your genes. And a whole schwack of Europe dying off may have given a few people a better chance to have kids than others. And thus, you and I and people listening to this today may have that gene. If Black, Black Death ever comes back, you will have a better chance at surviving. That's science news for this week. This week in pet science, let's talk about dogs sniffing out stress. Well, if the dogs could smell stress, I think it would be a big around our house this last week. Without getting into too much of the sad details, which I, I did mention last week's podcast, um, my mom's memorial was a couple days ago, and I know I've been feeling the stress leading up to the event. It's not something that you look forward to at all. Um, Dread is a better word for it. And um, since I'm the speaker of the family, I am I had to MC the event and that was very hard to do. Uh, but I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure I was oozing stress this entire week. And the dogs definitely picked up on it. Um, Beaker's so good. She, if you're having a bad day, she's the cuddler that comes up on the couch and cuddles with you. Um, whereas Bunsen is more the... This study comes to us from Queen's University, Belfast, where researchers found that dogs can smell stress in your sweat and your breath. Now, how do you ethically stress people out? Do you um, make them walk a plank? Do you put them up high? Do you show them things they're scared of? Do you, <laughs> do you go talk to them Monday morning? Um, do you... Do you take a random person who's never taught a class before and throw them in front of a bunch of teenagers? <laughs> no, um, they, they took people and before and after a quote unquote stressful activity, which was a, a math problem, they took samples of their sweat and samples of their breath. The people in the study reported how stressed they were before and after, and they also took things like blood pressure and heart rate. And in the study, the only people that were had their the only people that had their breath and their sweat analyzed and then thrown to the dogs or like ran through the study with the dogs were the people that said they were stressed from the math problem and their blood pressure and their heart rate increased. Now the dogs in the study were trained to search a scent lineup. To quickly explain this, there's lots of different ways a scent lineup can be used. You could have uh, four or five people, but only one of the persons has the scent on them. And when the dog correctly identifies the scent, um, 
they get a reward, a toy or treat, a pat, something like that. So the idea is the dog is trying to find the person that has the new scent on them. And then once they find that scent, they can then make it a little bit tougher for the dog and key in other things. This is one way a scent line is used. So the researchers weren't sure that if they gave one of the persons in the lineup the, the stress smell that the dogs could even detect it. An interesting thing is that every dog passed the test. They let the dog sample the relaxed sample, like the person before the math, and then the stressed out person after the math. And the dogs were correctly able to alert the researchers to the stress sample. Now, an unintended consequence of this study was a lot of the dogs were just normal dogs that people volunteered to be trained for the study. And one that did a really good job was a little cocker spaniel named Trio. And one of the things that they found, the, the owners found, like this is um, anecdotal after, is that from being trained to sniff out relax and stress, Trio at home could sense a mood change in people within the house. If anything, this study shows that dogs are sensitive to us. They're intuitive. They smell things that we could never hope to smell, and they make emotional responses to it to try and make us feel better. When trained appropriately, that's the essence of a service dog. That's Pet Science for this week. Hey everybody, before we get to the interview section, I thought I'd let you know how you could help out the Science Podcast. The Science Podcast will always be free to download. You'll never have to worry about paying for it. But here are some ways that you can help us out. Number one, check out the merch store, www.bunsenburnerbmd.com. The merch store has adorable gear, the beaker stuffy, and now text from Bunsen. Number two, think about joining the Pawpack community. It's going to be replacing Patreon, so thank you Patreon supporters. But if you aren't part of the Pawpack, we'd love for you to join. Our new community will take what we do on Patreon and supercharge it. There's going to be so many cool perks to joining the Pawpack community. Look for it in the next couple weeks. Third, think about reviewing the Science Podcast on a podcast player and giving us a great score. It really helps. Back to the interview. It's time for Ask an Expert on the Science Podcast, and I have Dr. Derek Miller, Materials Science Engineer, with us today. I'm doing great, Jason. How are you? I am so good. Um, Now, we we know all about Genius Lab Gear, and we'll get to that, but you're a full-fledged guest today, so welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And I just wanted to say, like, how excited I am to actually be on here. I've I've listened to a lot of episodes in the past, and and I also just wanted to say, like, you have such great energy on this podcast, and and you bring it, and then I think the guests pick it up from you, and so it always just keeps the energy up. Um, and you're just always so skilled at condensing these science topics and news into short, understandable stories, and you, you keep it fun the whole time, and I think it's a really great skill, and I think the science community needs more people like you doing this thing, so thank you for what you do, and uh, for keeping it up. Aw, thanks. Aw, I'm all verklempt now. <laughs> uh, well, okay, but I'll back to Back to reality, I bring my head from the down from the clouds. <laughs> um, Doc, where are you calling into the podcast from? Uh, so I live in Columbus, Ohio right now. Okay. Now, I, I mentioned you have a doctorate. In, could you explain a little bit to everybody what your education is? We kind of get the brass tacks out of the way first. Yeah. So I got my uh, bachelor's and PhD in material science and engineering. Um, it I, I've kind of had a, a bit of a path through that. Um, I can I'm happy to talk about my, my journey a little bit if you'd like. Sure. Yeah. Let's get into it. Um, so I, I guess going all the way back, I, I got into science and as a kid because of space and astronomy, which I think is pretty common for kids. Um, it always fascinated me. You know, I wanted to be an astronaut like a lot of other kids at the time. Um, so and I always kind of gradu- gravitated towards STEM subjects uh, in school. And uh, when I started applying to colleges, I didn't know what materials engineering was. Um, I wanted to do aerospace engineering, actually, but uh, not a lot of schools actually had aerospace engineering. And I, I talked to a materials professor who was designing uh, super alloys for jet engines, and I thought that seemed pretty close to, to aerospace engineering. Okay. Uh, so I jumped into that as a materials engineer, and uh, I loved it, and I never looked back. Um, and it, the thing about materials, a lot of people come into it not not really knowing what it is, and... Uh, I don't think any of them that I know have ever left. Um, and so what, the, say, what is it? What is so yeah. about it? What's the deal? 
you're right. I think what's addicting is by, you know, my freshman or sophomore year, I kind of figured out what it was. Um, when you understand how materials and how atoms behave at like a fundamental level, I think it brings you closer to understanding how the universe works. Like the, oh. the same principles that oh, determine goosebumps. how... Good goosebumps. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like if I was always into astronomy as a kid, but the same principles that determine how, you know, galaxies and planets form are also the same principles that are used to grow crystals for semiconductors and super alloys. So you kind of understand like how, just how the universe works. And that's what I really liked about it. Hmm. That would be addicting. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And you never stop learning. It, it's always, um, it is so cool. And, you know, by the time you're at the graduate level, like we even had microscopes that could see individual atoms, right? In, in these materials. They're what? multi-million dollar microscopes. What do they look like? What is an individual? Uh, just it like little fuzzy the- dots. Oh, okay. So they kind of, I was going to say, does it look like the, the spheres that I get my high school kids to use to build like methane? (laughs) Yeah. So they're little fuzzy dots because you're imaging them with an electron beam. And so you're not necessarily seeing the atom itself. You're seeing kind of the effect of the atom and they're little fuzzy dots in rows, um, in like rectangular hexagonal rows. Um, (laughs) and so that's, that part was really cool. That is cool. What did you, what did you say? See today, Derek? I saw yeah. atoms. Atoms, I know. And, so, <laughs> yeah. and the the microscopy like that, it's really popular in um in super alloys, which is kind of what I got into in the first place. Mm. Um, and that's what I did in in college. But then as I moved into grad school, I actually moved more towards ceramics. Um, How ended come? up doing what? what uh, why was that? Yeah, well, so super alloys. When I got into it, so I took a NASA internship at uh, in Cleveland. They have a a big NASA center there that works on um mostly aerospace, not as much space stuff, but uh, in the super alloys, it, it's a field that takes a long time to make something that works because there's like 20 years of testing involved mm, before it okay. gets onto an actual airplane. Um, and I found some other exciting projects there that I wanted to jump into. And so my, I did two more internships there actually, but in a different group um, in working on ceramics for heat shields for actually for like a Venus lander. Um, and that, that is was that really, the, cool. is that the new project there? Like did, was, you know how they're sending stuff to Venus, right? Uh, yeah, it's, it's changed forms a few times and hmm. they actually have a simulator there that simulates the Venus environment, which is oh, crazy. Cause it's like, it's like really high pressure. Yeah. Really high pressure yeah. and all these corrosive gases like yeah. sulfur and <laughs> other things in it. So they, they'll put something in there, they'll, they'll fire it up and they'll see how long it lasts. No way. Um, yeah. And so the, the NASA internship internships were really cool it was a cool way to tie in my love for space together with material science um and also anybody who's like in college right now just go apply to an ass internship right it's it's surprisingly accessible um they have a lot of them and you could just google it online and it was it was an amazing experience um so definitely highly highly recommend it um and then in in graduate school i i started doing that still um with nasa for a little bit and then i, I kind of drifted more towards electronic materials so things like semiconductors, um, solar panels, that kind of thing. Um, and then eventually I got my first job uh, after my PhD working on LEDs. Okay, so LEDs. Here here we go. Um, fascinating stories. Can I ask a follow-up question just from curiosity? Sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> did you get to play with that Venus simulator, like chuck different stuff at <laughs> Venus and see what made it and what didn't? I don't know. I That was not my project. I didn't get to play uh, with okay, it directly. One of the other interns did, though. It was his project to ensure that the simulator was simulating correctly, right? And he, oh, they were okay. partly in charge of, of putting things in there and seeing how, how long until they would fail. Because uh, I would spend, if I was, a, you know, let's say I was a younger me without kids, like that would be all day. I'd be like, let's throw an apple at Venus. <laughs> no. Let's not let's try this well, yeah, well, the, around yeah, the, the apple. Like I don't know, <laughs> see if it makes it. <laughs> well, yeah, back in the seventies and eighties, the Russians sent a bunch of probes. And I think like the first one died in the atmosphere. The second one lived for like five seconds. And after like sixteen probes, they finally had one survive for like a minute or two on the surface and send back data. And then they gave up. Yeah, I don't know if it was really ultimately worth it for them, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm, you know, I'm, we're not here to talk about Venus, but I'm excited for those missions going back to Venus. It's just such a wild it's and so weird cool. planet, eh? Yeah. Hmm. NASA internship. Well, good for you. Very exciting. Um, congratulations on your PhD too. Thank, um, you. Thank you. Yeah, and and now you're working with LED stuff. Um. So we can't get into the too much of the exactness of it because I believe you said it was proprietary. Um, 
So we don't want uh, anybody to come after me with those brain, you know, flashing memory wipe things. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> men in black. Yeah, men in black. Uh, could you talk to us a little bit? Let, let's start general, right? Like, so what are LEDs? Because I would hazard a guess that the average person has no idea what they are and how they work. So let's start there. Yeah. Yeah, and they've you know really just become mainstream in the last ten years or so. Uh, but yeah, I think a lot of people don't understand really how they're different than like an incandescent light bulb. Yeah. Um, so an incandescent bulb works by heating up a wire of you know usually tungsten really hot until the electrons are buzzing around so much they start just emitting light spontaneously as they change energy states. Mm -hmm. um, and almost eighty percent of that energy is wasted into heat, um, so it doesn't actually make a very good light. Um, but so LEDs are the newest generation of lighting and how you make it. And it, it's really goes back to the deep material science I was talking about. You grow ceramic crystals. Uh, when I say grow, you literally build them up layer by layer of atoms. Um, and you can grow them in two types. You can do an N type, which has an excess of electrons. And so N stands for negative, negative charge. Okay. Um, and then you can do a P type, which is a positive charge. Uh, and that has a lack of electrons or what we would call holes. And that's you know, kind of basic um, semiconductor science. Okay. And then what you can do is, well, to create those N-type and P-type layers, you um, usually bombard it or build in special atoms that have different charge states than the normal atom that's there. And so that's what we call doping the material. So if you have um, a, like a, a group six, um, for instance, a group six atom where there should be a five or a four atom, it's got an extra electron. And so you can build that into the material so you have this discrepancy in where the electrons live and kind of where they want to be. Oh, so one, one part has too much, the other part doesn't have enough. Yep, yep. So yep. that sets the stage for the reaction that makes the light. Um, and so what you want to do is you end up making kind of a ceramic sandwich. Uh, you use the <laughs> N-type and the P-type. Yep, N-type and P-type are the bread. And then uh, the middle of the sandwich is a neutral buffer layer that just keeps them keeps the electrons from moving you know, back and forth on their own. But what happens is if you put a bias voltage across it, you, um, you lower the, call it the activation energy or the energy barrier, and you allow these electrons to drift across the neutral layer into the P region. Um, and so think of it as like these electrons are cruising around, they're saying they're flying in the sky, and they look down and they see a nice cozy bed that's just custom made for them. And they're like, that looks nice. I'm going to drop into that bed right now and go to sleep. <laughs> and that's kind of what happens. They they drop in energy states into this hole where there's a lack of an electron. Mm -hmm. And when they drop in energy, that energy has to go somewhere. So that energy can be lost as a phonon, so um, thermal energy. Or in good semiconductors, it can be emitted as a photon or like a packet of light. Um, and that's similar in, in chemistry if you've learned about the HOMO and LUMO states for molecular orbitals, uh, mm -hmm. when it, you know, when an electron changes state, it can release that energy difference in the same way. That's, but in semiconductors, we call Bohr, this... The famous Bohr experiment to figure out... The exactly. Thing. Okay, gotcha. Yep. Yep. And so in semiconductors, we call this the band gap. Um, what is that energy difference? And so if it's a big band gap, the electrons have a lot of energy to dissipate. And so all those high energy photons would be like a blue or even a UV. Mm -hmm. So those are the, the shorter wavelength ones or the higher energy, kind yeah. of like gamma rays, right? Gamma rays are the highest energy. Ooh. You um, don't get that yeah. from LEDs, right? Nope, you don't. You know, not yet, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then oh, the low energy great. photons, yeah. The low energy photons would be like green, red, or even infrared. So those are the longer wavelengths, so like the, the okay. weaker energy type photons. What a good explanation. So I, no, I love it. That's such, <laughs> I teach um, interbacularic chemistry. So the Bohr, the famous Bohr experiment to figure out that there's different energy levels within an atom um, is exactly what you're explaining. The electron, as it falls, um, it ha that energy has to go somewhere. And the more energy it releases, you get closer to, well, the shorter wavelength and you get that UV and the longer you get infrared. Um, yep. and so, I love it. Yeah. And there's a um, few more ways. There's Does, a few more ways. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so I, I can follow up just to just to finish it off for a second. Yeah. Um, finish it. The energy difference is actually goes back to material science again. It actually depends on how far apart the the atoms are in the atomic lattice, um, and you can change that by mixing different materials in different compositions. So like gallium, uh, nitrogen, indium, sometimes aluminum. The right composition, you can tune how high that energy state is. And so that's how you can decide what uh, wavelength of light you want this LED to emit. But the problem is 
most people don't want like a blue LED or a red LED. They want a white LED. They do, yeah. And yeah, and so you can't make white just with one of these. And so the way that we actually make white LEDs, like the ones you buy for light bulbs in your house, is it's usually a blue LED. So it emits light at about 450 nanometers, and then it's covered in a phosphorescent material. Oh. And this is usually like a, for instance, like a yttrium aluminum garnet. It's a ceramic material is a typical one and that absorbs the blue light it like catches the the photon um by boosting an electron in the energy state and then when that electron falls back to its original state it emits a lower energy level of light which is usually either yellow or green or red and so by mixing the right phosphors with the right blue light you can kind of custom tune the color and the spectrum emitted from that to get whatever you want and so it, all the advancements in LEDs, like the last five years especially, um, it really comes down to material science improvements. So by being able to grow better crystals uh, and, and better ceramics and, and new materials, you can get new colors. And the more colors you have at your disposal, you can get better qualities of light. And that's why LEDs, you know, 10 years ago, people hated them. And now they're more mainstream <laughs> and they're, they're much better um, and more uh, people are more accepting of having them in their house. Yeah, like uh, 10 years ago, a light bulb was like a hundred dollars, a hundred and fifty dollars. Um, and, and you, nobody in their right mind, if, unless they were extremely wealthy would be putting in led light bulbs in their house. Um, now they're pretty comparable. And of course their, their longevity and their brightness is so much better than an incandescent bulb. Mm -hmm. And they use a fraction of the energy. Um, so there's that too. Exactly. I think a lot yeah. of people don't understand that you grow LED stuff. Like the, the the thing that makes it go, it's like your farmers of of this stuff. Yep. You basically grow crystals in this big uh, chamber that we would call a reactor, and you pump in different gases um, of different um, <laughs> it's, it's different like precursors. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of these different precursors of gases, and you got to get the temperature and the pressure just right, or else you'll have all kinds of defects and the defects make it less efficient. Mm -hmm. um, and so they've just, over time, they've gotten much, much better at making high quality, low defect uh, materials. And it's, it's really, um, that's kind of the root of the semiconductor science. So have we hit um, the, like, are we peaking with this technology or is it just going to keep going more? Like our LED? Yeah, that's a great like, question. Yeah. We're getting close to the maximum efficiency of LEDs. Put okay. it that way, um, which is somewhere in the 80 to 90, maybe low 90% efficiency um, is where we're probably going to end up. Um, but where there's still a lot of room for growth in LEDs is the longevity, um, the reliability, and especially the color quality. And that's what's really happened just the last two or three years is we've gotten better materials for like cyan light is a big one, which we didn't have for a long time, mm. uh, deep reds, and then into the UV. And so those are all new. And those um, tools let us make different spectra of light that we can do a, a lot of cool new things with. All right. That is very exciting. Okay. LEDs, super cool. Thank you for that um, amazing breakdown of them. But let's, uh, let's move to the next question. And that's Genius Lab Gear. Could you talk to us a little bit about Genius Lab Gear? Sure. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so I, the kind of the reason I started Genius Lab Gear is, I mean, most people know that laboratory research is hard, like really hard. Um, but obviously, like there's the challenging science part of it, but that's also the fun part. But in practice, there's just so many little problems and frustrations that they just eat away at your energy and your motivation day to day. And they make a lab work a lot harder than it should be. And they're little things that, you know, come up and nobody ever really goes about solving those problems. Sometimes they have like lab hacks, right? Which is a great way to solve some of these problems. And I always thought I could help fix some of these things. I could, you know, design some items, make some clever inventions that kind of help with these problems and make research a little bit more fun. And that was kind of the idea behind it. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I started Genius Lab Gear as a hobby, kind of my free time on nights and weekends uh, back in like late 2018. Um, I had a few ideas at first for like little widgets that would make it easier to work in a fume hood or like a lab bench where, um, you know, organization is important and you like to keep things off the, off the floor and keep things, you know, maybe color coded, just like little, little helpful tools. Um, and so I, I started by, I designed and 3d printed some prototypes and they worked great and I love them. Um, but then I got injection mold block quotes which were like 20 or $30,000, uh, mm -hmm. for each 
product. And I said, that's, I can't do that right now. That's too expensive. <laughs> I, I haven't even sold anything. Um, so expensive. Sorry. It, 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 yeah, <laughs> exactly. So I was like, this, this is not going to work as is. Um, so I had to pivot a little bit and I was trying to look around, okay, how else can I, can I do this? Can I solve problems without buying a crazy expensive, you know, injection mold block? Um, and then I, at one point, I, I, I read a story about someone who redesigned egg cartons, right? So a very simple thing, but he, they did, redesigned it to be lighter, like more protective and more eco-friendly. Mm-hmm. And the, the whole point of that story was that some of the simplest things in our life haven't been redesigned in decades. And we just kind of, we're kind of blind to them. It's just like, oh yeah, that's just the way it is. Um, and you don't really think about how it could be better when it's something you've just used that way for your whole life. Mm. Um and around that time, so I, I, I saw on my desk, I had this like flimsy little transparent plastic ruler. And I was just like, oh, well, that's something scientists and engineers use all the time. And mine is terrible. And it does a, a basic function, but it could be so much better. Um, my dog's barking in the background. I, I hear, hear that. that. It's all good. You can keep going. It's fine. It's, okay. it's fine. Okay. Unless, it's, um, unless you're distracted, then you can wait. It's uh, up. You go ahead. No, I, it's probably okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I, I looked at the ruler and, and I decided to make my own. I was like, what is the best ruler I could possibly make for, you know, someone in science or engineering? And so I made a CAD model. I wanted a solid titanium ruler, um, that would have a protractor, a bottle opener. Yeah. I want like aerospace grade titanium yeah. and I want a ton of reference information, you know, unit conversions of things, laser engraved. Yeah. And I want to anodize it into all these cool, bright colors. Um, and I made a design I loved and I got it manufactured in, in three prototypes, and uh, the prototypes cost me, I wasn't prepared for this at the time, but I was so far in, it cost me $450 for three rulers. So I think I made the world's most expensive ruler <laughs> and at $150 a ruler. And I got these in and I was honestly just kind of disappointed. They just didn't feel great to use. Um, they felt a little clumsy. I was like this, and, and they were going to, I was going to have to charge like $50 a ruler. Um, so I was like, I, this also probably isn't going to work. How can I do this on a, on a smaller scale? And I'd had a pocket tool at the time, and I, I kind of decided, well, why don't I make a pocket tool um, specifically for scientists? That was kind of the the seed idea. Yeah. So I did the same thing. You know, I thought, like, what are all the equations and unit conversions and references? You know, Planck's constant. Yep. Uh, you know, PV and RT. PV and um, RT. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. And molar gas constant. What are all these things that you you don't really want to get out your phone and Google every time you go get distracted in the middle of your homework. Um, <laughs> and so I, I got one made um, from a manufacturer and I don't know if anybody else got this, uh, but I named it as a play on words to rocket scientist and I call it the pocket scientist. Um, and so that was the, the first product I, I really made, um, sold some, did well, people loved it. And then uh, I actually, I'd built in a little hexagon hole in it for yeah. uh, a wrench, like a, a quarter inch wrench just as an extra tool you, to build in um and a chemistry was a chemistry teacher that commented like oh i would just love that hex that hexagon stencil um, to draw chemistry. organic molecules yeah exactly exactly so i was like oh i could make a pocket chemist and so i did and i, I was able to build it in like seven or eight different molecule stencils you know carbon chain uh cycloheptane you know butane propane benzene um even a chair conformation right um and then plus the ruler and some unit conversions and things, uh, molar gas constant. Um, and then that one did even better. And then I made a, a pocket engineer the following year, which did even better still. Um, and then this year I launched finally the pocket physicist. So that, that's kind of covers my core like expertise. And I got, you know, scientists in each field to help, you know, troubleshoot the design and make sure I had everything that I needed um, for those. And I'm still planning on making some other pocket tools and things. Um, if anybody listening wants me to make a pocket tool for their their field, you know, message me on Twitter <laughs> or something and let me know because uh, I'm definitely looking to do more of these. Um, but people, it just makes me so happy to read the reviews on these. People love them. They they literally use them on their homework like every day or I've gotten pictures of them using them at their jobs. Um, I use mine in the kitchen just doing home improvement even at my computer. So it's just like a fun, small little tool. It makes for, um, you know, a lot of people get it as a gift, like going into college and things, graduation mm-hmm. gift. Um, so th- that's been a lot of fun. Um, and then I kind of wandered my way into um, some STEM uh, themed word magnets, which are a ton of fun. Uh, I ended up making 10 different ones for like different fields like chemistry, microbiology, neuroscience, you, know, you name it. Um, and those 
make me smile a lot every day because people post uh, what their little phrases are that they make. <laughs> yeah, I they can post imagine. on Twitter, Instagram. <laughs> some of them are really funny. Um, some of them are kind of dirty. Uh, so, oh. you know, the the words that I included are like PG-13, so they can be a little bit edgy uh, at times. And, and it's fun for, you know, rants about your your work or um, leaving, you know, passive aggressive comments to colleagues in the lab. Um, one thing that happened is actually during the pandemic, people, when people were taking turns going into lab, so they didn't, uh, you know, uh, weren't there at the same time, they would leave messages uh, in the word magnets for the next person to find. Um, and they turned like this little game of leaving messages back and forth for each other, uh, which was a ton of fun. Um, so those are kind of the, the core things I'm making right now. And I'm trying to add some more things to those. But um, uh, now that that's up and running and going and I feel good about it. Now I'm like focusing more on what are some more like laboratory research tools that I can make to, mm -hmm. to really go back to the original mission and um, make sure I can, I can make a difference for the day-to-day the -day in the laboratory. Um, so I've got a few new projects coming up for that, which we can maybe talk about in a little bit. Okay, perfect. Um, I think you sent us the pocket chemist because um, I know it's got the little stencils in it and that's yeah. on my desk and and i use it all the time awesome. Um, awesome my students fight over getting to use it because it's got some of the stuff they have to memorize on it and i <laughs> yeah. forgot about that for a second and all of the little uh <laughs> the little you know the constants and things like that so yeah it's yeah. that's really helpful yeah i love it um okay so uh, again derek we'll have to move on if that's okay um mm -hmm. to the next question so Genius Lab Gear, there's a website for that, and we will make sure that's in the show notes so you're one click away from checking out this stuff. Uh, thanks for chatting about that with us, Derek. Yeah, no problem. It was fun. So we, we have a couple of staple questions we're going to get to now, the ones that um, we ask all of our guests that are um, to, to talk about, and one pertains to pets. It's called The Pet Story. We get our guests to share a pet story from their life with us. And guess what? You're up, Doc. Uh, do you have a pet story you could share with us? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Um, I mean, I've got a lot of them. I've had dogs my whole life. But uh, I'd say my favorite one is, um, well, maybe, I don't know if you agree or not, but I've always thought that dogs definitely understand more of what's going around on around them than what we give them credit for. Like Kind of like a two-year-old. Like <laughs> yeah. they, they get it. They just can't communicate it. So um, one thing that happened when uh, so my brother, he – had just graduated college, but I was still in high school and he got a rescue dog named Nuxie. Um, and it was right after the housing market crash. So he was living with us uh, that year. Mm -hmm. And so we got to help kind of raise the the puppy, um, oh. which was a lot of fun. And he, uh, <laughs> dog Nuxie eventually learned n not to get in the car because going into the car meant we were going to the vet. But um, <laughs> he, you know, eventually he got to about 12 months old. He started getting very interested in pillows and you know we knew it was it was time to get him neutered. There's no time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yep. So we convinced him to get in the car. Like he was like, no, 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 I'm not going in. Bad things happen. And we said, no, 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 it'll be fine. Here's some treats. Um, and so we tricked him into that. And uh, on the way home in the op after the operation, like I like I looked in his eyes and I could tell he was really sad and almost like he he knew what just happened. Oh. He understood it and he was just sad about it at the time. And oh. so we we got him out of the car and he wasn't even interested in running around the yard at all. Um, he just wanted to go straight in the house. So we let him into the house and I kid you not what he did. He, he ran straight upstairs to the far end of the house, jumped up on my brother's bed who took him to get neutered and he pooped on it. <laughs> He's so mad. <laughs> <laughs> just straight payback. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, I'm trying to remember what happened with Bunsen. and I think, it didn't, he didn't really get phased by it that much, but I've heard about that with some other dogs. Um, <laughs> they get a little upset. Bunsen gets upset with us when he gets wet and he blames us for him getting Ooh. wet. Um, we went kayaking in the ocean and he fell out and he didn't look at me or listen to me for an entire day. Like he oh, wouldn't no. even make eye contact. And he's like the happiest, friendliest guy ever. I was just nothing. I was dead to him. And then before, um, if you follow us on social media, I was posting, we got to go to uh, the science center and put on a show. And then there was a meet and greet with them. So we took Bunsen to get a bath. Well, not me, my wife did. And he was so unimpressed with my wife after that. She was trying to talk to him and he was turning his head. He wouldn't even look at her. So yeah, Aww. it's not as oh. bad as a poop on a bed, but it is a little <laughs> bit of a payback. It's like the cold. Always, always bring a towel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Um, was was everything good after that? It was just the one payback. I think so. I mean, yeah. he definitely blamed my brother for what happened, and he knew it. it was, cool. He knew it was his fault, cool. and uh, so it took a few days. But I think eventually he warmed back up. Yeah, with cats, I think sometimes I've heard stories that that just continues, like the spiteful behavior. Just continues. oh, really? Yeah, well, I've never had a cat, so. <laughs> People keep uh, warning me that every time I put t- our my son's rescue cat Ginger into like a hat or a costume, that she's gonna poop in my shoes. But it hasn't happened yet. So. <laughs> Just yeah, put a, put your shoes away. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, thanks for sharing your story. That was a, a touching story. Um, the other the other standard question we have for our guests is the super fact. And that's something that you know that when you tell people, it kind of like wow, blows their mind a bit. Do you have a super fact you could share with us? Absolutely. Yeah. I, this one's just from a few weeks ago. Um, like I said, I'm kind of a space nerd. And uh, I I watched the live unveiling of the first um, James Webb Space Telescope images a few weeks oh, ago. Uh, yeah, so those cool. are so cool. And yeah. for anybody listening, if you haven't seen it yet, go download like the full res version of the of the new deep field. New deep so field. there's the old Hubble. Yeah, there's the Hubble deep field. But then the new one is the James Webb deep field, which has yeah. way more re- resolution. And it actually shows a lot more galaxies um, in that. So in that photo, there's I can see at least several hundred galaxies. They said there's thousands just in that in that one photo. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm looking at this photo, like zooming into all these different galaxies. I'm just thinking like those galaxies look just like ours. There's there's so many of them. Them there just has to be some like Star Wars saga going on in <laughs> one of those galaxies. Probably one of the far far away ones, most likely. And so I, I was just looking at how many of these galaxies there are in this one little photo, and I'm thinking to myself like how how much of the sky is this right is it like half the sky or is it like the size of the moon is it like if i held a golf ball in my hand you know out at arm's length is it like the size of a golf ball um but later on they said that, that image the entire image with thousands of galaxies in it it represented only a a section of sky equivalent to holding a grain of sand at arm's length uh up to the sky that's how much of the sky packs in you know, a thousand galaxies and that so that blew my mind it's so mind-boggling yeah it is so um cool. i you know there's a lot of science communicators we follow and like they posted their they videoed themselves reacting to it um mm-hmm. and some of them like broke down and cried i actually had tears in my eyes when i was watching was it um the american president he was he the one that unveiled it with the the science? yeah yeah, okay. President Biden unveiled um, the first one, which right. was yeah, yeah which was uh, like a bonus was... one, and then later the next day they did the other four. Right, and yeah, I I just love looking at those. It makes you it like kind of humbles you. It makes you realize how lucky we are to be you know where we are, and also how we're just you know this beautiful blue little little ball floating in this expanse of nothingness, <laughs> and just like uh, how lucky we are to have you know, what we have. So it just makes you want to um, take care of, you know, take care of the earth a little bit more. Yeah. I look at it and I'm like, I'm I'm with you. I'm like, there has to be aliens in those galaxies. I gotta mean, be, 100%. there's gotta be, there's just too many. Somewhere. Somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then they've got their own James Webb telescope and it's like pointed at and us. They're looking at us. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> exactly but i don't think the milky way existed if they're looking at it sent from the same time that we're looking at those ones right like because it's so far that, away that's um, true yeah they might be looking at us but we can't see each other because the light hasn't got hasn't crossed paths yet oh my so wild that'll mess you up too you have to go sit on mm-hmm. a hill and just contemplate existence um exactly. <laughs> well thanks for bringing up that um yeah the james webb telescope so cool the jwst uh so the the last section is a fun one we get to know our guests a little bit more uh we talk about a hobby or cause that's near and dear to them in the important to the you section and derek you wanted to talk about the lab coat project so take it away yeah so the lab coat project is what i'm literally spending all of my free time on right now um it is i i've was passionate when I started and I've gotten even more passionate about it since then because of really because of some of the feedback that's come in. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you why uh, it, for me personally, it started, it was, I remember it's the first day of my PhD research. I was really excited. I came in, I had a fellowship. I had the whole thing figured out. I knew the research I was going to do. Um, you know, we, I met my group members. We went out to lunch. We got like the best local burrito place on campus. And then we went to the lab to get, to get started um, for the day. And I, 
I walked in the lab, you know, I got excited. I heard the hum of the fume hood and the faint smell <laughs> of solvent. And it's just like, I it was like, I know this is where I wanted to be. Um, I'm starting my journey to become a real scientist. And I just loved it. Yeah. And then uh, I got my lab coat and calling it my lab coat is a little bit of an exaggeration. It was just a lab coat from who knows where. And it was just the one that wasn't being used anymore. Um, and it was a large, but I'm usually medium. And somehow, even though it was a large, my sleeves were still too short. Uh, every time I reached for the most dangerous chemicals in the back of the cabinet, my, my wrist would become exposed. Um, and then on the second day, I caught my reflection in this big acrylic panel that we had. And I just thought like, is this what a scientist looked like? Like I felt felt like one of those child actors in say like a 1950s movie who plays as plays like a ghost by they just throw a big white bed sheet over their head right that's what i felt <laughs> like i looked like and and even for me i'm just like a very average you know sized person and i can't imagine for people who have different body types what it's like for them and over the next few weeks you know maybe i could have gotten one that, that fits a little bit better but that wouldn't have solved all the problems um, I kept having these little aggravations mount just kind of because of the design. Uh, <laughs> like I would, I would put my phone in the big front pocket in the, on the bottom and it would just swing around wildly as I walked back and forth and like run into equipment and things. Oh, I can't. Um, I would, yeah, that would happen. That. Yeah. Yeah. You're just kicking it the whole time. Um, <laughs> or you put it in your, in your jeans pocket underneath the lab coat, then you can't get to it and you have to, you know, put a string, a headphone cord. This is before Bluetooth was, was really popular <laughs> string, a headphone cord through it. Um, and, like you would, I would drop something on the floor and I'd bend over to pick it up. It would fly and up. Yeah. And I had like, I had like my one precious fine tip Sharpie that was definitely mine and no one else's. And I had to protect it with my life and it would just fall out of my breast pocket every time I bent over <laughs> and I'd have to go scramble under some equipment to like pick it up wherever it slid over. Um, and <laughs> it was, it was like that. If you ever saw that classic pizza boy delivery commercial where every time he slams on the brakes, he has to throw his arm out to stop the pizza from going through the windshield. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the, the last scene is like his girlfriend's on the side instead of the pizza, but he still has the same reaction. Oh no. <laughs> um, and, but I felt like that, like I developed literally a habit of putting my arm over my chest pocket every time I bent over to pick something up. Um, and eventually I just kind of stopped wearing it. Like uh, I, I'd put it on here and there if I got out the dangerous stuff, like the perchlorates mm -hmm. or the strong, the strong acids. But um, you know, I definitely still put myself at some risk there. Um, but like looking back now, I kind of realized that I was mostly forced into making a bad decision because of poor design. Like mm. it, it starts with the design and people should feel good about wearing them uh, and want to wear them to be protected. Um, and that was almost 10 years ago now. And the frustration never really went away. Mm -hmm. Um, I just kind of moved on from using them. Uh, and so, you know, fast forward, uh, almost 10 years and the, you know, Genius Lab year now is more stable. Um, I have more resources. I have a better network. And it, it became a problem that I decided I wanted to tackle. Um, and so if you think about it, like most lab coats are just rectangles with three pockets. Um, like no one ever actually thought what would a perfect lab coat look like? What What do scientists really need? Mm -hmm. um, it's like the, the original lab coat was probably invented in the early 1900s, right? It hasn't really changed since since then. And you know what else was invented in the early 1900s? They head, their head out of and just wore the table. It, exactly. <laughs> Only just a couple of pockets and a, a white you know, coat with lapels. Exactly. <laughs> so the if you compare it to like the Model T came out in I think 1908, probably about the same time as, as some of the first lab coats. What if everybody just said, that's good enough. It's faster than horses. It carries three people. Like, what if we just stopped innovating on cars? Uh, <laughs> that's kind of what I feel like has happened in lab coats. And there are, I mean, I have to say that there are some really good lab coats out there. There's some amazing lab coats, but they're designed for or for doctors, doctors, dentists, uh, mm. pharmacists, nurses, right? And they're all like over $100. They're excellent lab coats, but they're not great for scientists um, because the materials are made out of and because the way like the pockets and functions are designed um, and they're designed to look like look really good like look like you're on Gray's Anatomy more than actually be functional in a, in a laboratory um, and it's just a kind of a theme that I've picked up that a lot of times the needs of scientists and engineers are pretty low on the totem pole in terms of um, what they need to succeed um, both in organizations and just on the market like so there's just not great lab coats available designed for scientists. Um, and so that's what I wanted to address. So 
Um, at one point I was on a long drive during COVID cause I didn't want to fly. And it just like, I was mulling this over in my head and I decided it just hit me how I could actually do this. Well, like I know I'm just one person. I can't design the world's best lab coat by myself. Um, but it came to me that I bet me and a thousand friends could design the world's best lab coat if we work mm-hmm. together on it. So earlier this year, I launched a survey. It was like an eight minute Google form response. And I set a goal of a thousand responses. And I said, if we got a thousand responses, I will start putting the money into prototyping it. Um, and actually, as of yesterday, not no joke, yesterday, we hit a thousand um, finally. That's so sweet. that is a, a huge milestone. And I'm starting the pro actually I, I cheated i started the prototyping a little bit early because i was getting really excited about it okay um but now i feel like we have you know kind of the critical mass of data um to get going on the design and um if, if you like some of the data is really fun i can share with you if you want to guess some of the I answers think, i think um, that would be great um, i think i have some sound i think i have a theme song we could use actually Ooh, perfect <laughs> <laughs> survey says all right so if you had to choose for your lab coat how to close it you yep. get you've got normal buttons you've got snaps you've got zippers or one of the responses was just leave it open and let it flow what do you think people preferred snaps buttons or zippers or mm. just leaving it open mm. a zipper i'm gonna say a snap Ding, ding, ding. That is correct. Sweet. Yes. Yeah, snaps won 60% of the vote. Buttons came in second at only 20%. And that surprised me, actually. Um, I even broke it down by field, uh, medical, you know, life sciences and wet chemistry. And all three fields almost evenly preferred snaps. And snaps are far and away the better choice, in my opinion. Like, you can rip it off like Superman. Yep. If you catch on fire, yep. uh, get out of there quick. And you can also get to lunge a lot faster. And, and buttons wreck. Buttons. I've, had, I've had so many buttons, like, they just pop off and you're like, oh, eventually, God, yep. so frustrated. Eventually, they just come off. Um, okay, number two. Okay. For the cuffs. No, okay, you and I your... haven't talked. So if I get all these right, yeah. I'm not cheating. We don't. I have no there's idea what's no going on. In, there's no inside baseball here. <laughs> okay, right. Okay, for the cuffs, you've got the straight cuffs, which is like a normal, um, you know, like a doctor's lab coat yeah. that's kind of open. Or you have those long knit cuffs, which kind of hug your wrist over the course of, you know, three or four inches. Yeah. Um, there's a couple other options too. But what do you think out of those two? Uh, no cuff, just straight. Straight cuffs. Yeah. It was actually long knit cuffs. Oh, really? Like, and I and I love that answer because I had I have had lab coats with both, and if you have the straight cuffs, what happens is they hang down by a few inches, and as you're doing experiments in the fume hood, oh, you drip in it. Well, in you way. it hangs down. You I've knocked over glassware yep. several times by having these big clumsy cuffs, and it knocks over glassware. It could like break something, and it can spill chemicals everywhere. Um, and it also the long knit cuffs hug your wrist a little bit, so they actually keep your wrist safe when you extend your arms. And so that's the answer I wanted to see. And the data came through all three fields again, preferred the long knit cuffs, which I was really happy about. Okay. That makes sense. I, I should have got that. All right. Um, number three, you have two different ways to make the collar. You can do a, a traditional collar, which is kind of open like a tuxedo with little lapels. Um, or you can do uh, like a chef's collar, which covers part of your neck and closes all the way up to your collarbone. Which do you think was the most popular? Ugh. I'm going to say the chef's one because that collared one, it it gets ruffled and gets stuck when I'm trying to use it. Like put it on and like, maybe I forget and people make fun of me because I look like Elvis Presley. <laughs> You've got the, yeah, they got the flipped up collar. Yeah. Um, so actually the, the most respondents, about 60% prefer the tuxedo collar. Okay. And this one, I actually wanted it to go the other way um, because you have better protection against chemicals if your neck is fully covered. Um, mm. The tuxedo one is more, it looks, I guess some people think it looks more professional, um, but it really is meant to be worn with like a, a dress shirt. It comes about from like the 1950s when people would wear suits and you know ties with, with big collars under them. And that protects the rest of your neck. But what happens now is you've got grad students wearing, you know, V-necks um, under these. And so their entire like nest, uh, neck and chest is still exposed. Um, so we want to follow the data here. And I think what we're able to do is actually make a convertible collar to do both. So we've been trying to figure out that design. And I think we can actually make both people happy. 
um, and keep it safe. But if they want to wear it like the lapel, the traditional way, then then they can um, convert it to that too. Okay. All right. I I I, I like the other way, but it's okay. <laughs> me too. Me too. I, I like the the full collar. Um, okay. Number four. What do you think was the most requested feature to add uh, or improvement needed on lab coats? The options are, here's the, the top five, um, a belt to tighten the waist, uh, more complete skin protection from chemicals, uh, more pockets for personal items, or holes for headphone cord uh, to connect your phone. Out of those five, <laughs> what do you think was the... Uh, the most voted response. I don't know. See, like I'm an old guy now. So so if I was to put myself in, hmm, I'm going to say more pockets. That is correct. Because a lot of women's <laughs> clothing is kind of sexist and they don't even have pockets in their own clothing. Yes, yes. So more than half the people said they need more pockets. And that was like a consistent theme through all of the data. So uh, right now the design we have drafted up has like seven to nine pockets, depending nice. on where we land instead of You're the normal so three. So, all those pockets. <laughs> yes. So many pockets and like little pen holes and things too, um, to keep them from sliding out. So, but actually I think we're going to be able to build in all of the top five. Uh, so I think we, we're going to have a belt, um, also better protection from chemicals and a little, um, hole for the headphone cord. Nice. So I think we can actually do all five. Um, okay. Number five, final question. Okay. Besides white, what was the most voted, most popular color that people would want their lab coat to be? Of all of the colors I could pick? Out of all the colors you could pick. And I can't pick car- combinations like tie-dye. Uh, that is one of the answers. Oh, hmm. Okay, but I got to think professionally because tie-dye is whimsical, but not a professional color. Um, I'm going to say a shade of blue basically you're right okay so i'll explain it number one was white number two was actually black which surprised me a little bit but i think that's because blue is split into three shades navy blue medium blue light blue so if you combine all the blues you actually get uh more popular answer than black so black gotcha yeah yep yep so that is uh probably blue would be the next uh the next color we would make besides white and then we'd also Um, look at black and gray Gray, and oh then, gray, because yeah. the color. Like if you're, I mean, you'd look cool in a red lab coat. Um, but I can't mm-hmm. imagine too many people would want that though. Exactly, exactly. Or hot pink, that'd be, that'd be cool too. Pink, pink actually got a lot of votes too. Yeah, yeah that's I. We definitely want to make a pink one. Um, it's a yeah. matter of uh getting the manufacturing volumes there, uh, yeah, to make it make sense. Um, so yeah. In part of the forum, there's a, there's a free forum rant about your lab coat, and this is where some of the best the best <laughs> stuff has come in. People write all kinds of, of funny stuff. Uh, so uh, I'll share a few of them with you. Um, one person said, I just wish it looked cooler and literally fit any part of my body. Like the sleeves are so loose and baggy and trail around. I wear a medium, and no matter what size I get, it looks like I'm swimming in it. Ugh, this is dope. I'm glad someone cares. Thank you. Uh, another one was, they said, it's ugly, thin, why is my neck exposed? Are these sleeves or are they parachutes? The pockets are too big to be functional and they sit low, too low to make sense. <laughs> and then um, two, so one of the things that I, I really started to understand reading through these comments is um, how many problems uh, women have with a lot of these lab coats mm-hmm. because most of them are actually unisex lab coats, which just means that they're just they're cylinders. Men. They're just cylinders and they're really just fit for men. Yeah. And there's not a lot of lab coats that have women cu- women's cuts out there. So that's one thing that we want to do. And I've got two quotes I could read you um, from women explaining kind of what these problems are. Uh, one, one woman said, the hips. I can either have cuffs too long, such that they knock everything over, or hips so narrow that the lowest button won't fasten. It's embarrassing to pop a button when you bend over. Then the last one is, this, this is a really powerful one um, that really got me. It's... Uh, she said, no matter where I shop for a lab coat, I feel horrible about myself afterwards. Mm. Like there's something wrong with me. No. Reaffirming that I'm not the body type I'm supposed to be. Ugh. I'm a curvy woman. I have petite shoulders, but wide hips. I have to choose between buttons popping open at my waist and hips if I bend, sit, or take too long a stride. Or I can have the hips fit and button up, but top 
but up top, I look like a hot air balloon and extra fabric gets in the way and just makes me look awful. I get really self-conscious whenever I have to put my lab coat on. Either way, I just feel bad about myself, like science fields aren't meant for fat people. Ooh. And that one really got me. And that's the problem that I never really <laughs> deeply understood. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm getting all emotional about that. It's terrible. Exactly. Yeah. And so I'm reading through these comments. I'm just like, you know, I get even more fired up about it yeah. that we have to, you know, we have to fix this. Um, we're going to do a beta test round. We're going to make sure the beta testers are people of all body types to really nail the fit. And hopefully, you know, I'd like to make like a petite version. I'd like to make a plus size version or mm-hmm. like a, a long and tall version if possible. Um, I'd even make, like to make a maternity version too, if we can make that work oh. in the manufacturing. So those are all things that don't really exist out there. And that's no. what I want to do. We just need, we just need the volume to be able to manufacture these. And so that's where just, we really need people's support to, you know, tell their friends about it, share the social media posts, um, to try to get, we need, we still need more survey responses too. Um, oh, we'll get we, you that. 10, we will get you that. Yeah. Right. Even though we got to a thousand, um, it's a good data set for some of the designs, but we really need more fit data for different body types and also for people who work in different fields. Um, we need more data and we need more of a grassroots effort to try to get this out there because eventually we're going to do a pre-order. And if we if we don't get enough pre-orders, we're probably not going to do a manufacturing run because it's so expensive to mm-hmm. put in that run. And so when it comes to that pre-order, we're just really going to need a lot of help um, to get the word out there. And so if you want to take the survey, if you haven't yet, um, you can go to geniuslabgear.com. That is G-E-N-I-U-S-L-A-B-G-E-A-R.com slash Bunsen. Uh, and there you'll find the survey form. Uh, it only takes about eight minutes. And uh, if you complete the survey, there's a code at the end for everybody who takes the survey that you can get 15% off the lab coat uh, uh, when it launches. Uh, and and if you're listening from the future, uh, if it's 2023 already, uh, you go to the same page, and we just might have the lab coats available uh, by then. So uh, we could use all the help we can get. I really believe in this project. And um, yeah, tell your friends and, and take the survey if you haven't yet. That is amazing. Okay, so yeah, we'll make sure that link is in the show notes too. So Definitely. you don't have to just listen to it. It'll be just one click away. <laughs> okay, yeah, that would be fantastic. Awesome. Derek, we're at the end of the chat. Um, This was so fun. I've been smiling ear to ear. I've learned, I've laughed and, uh, and got all verklempt over how science has let down people with just how the lab coat fits. So this was such a good chat. Thank you so much for being our guest today. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Jason. I I really enjoy talking to you. and I I love listening to your lab to your podcast, too. So Thanks for doing that. And thanks for having me on. No problem. Now, before we go, um, do you have social media that uh, do you have social media handles that anybody can follow? Definitely. Yeah. Um, I, I don't have a lot of personal handles there, but mm. I have Genius Lab Gear handles. So Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, even TikTok. Uh, Genius Lab Gear uh, is just the handle. OK, perfect. Well, again, we'll make sure that's in the show notes as well. Fantastic. Well, here's to the future of a better lab coat and the future of LED stuff. Um, (laughs) We're going places for sure. I'm excited (laughs) about it. Yeah. Um, Take care of yourself, Doc. Thanks so much for being here again. You too, Jason. Thank you. Okay. It's time for story time with me, Adam. If you don't know what story time is, story time is when we talk about stories that have happened within the past one or two weeks. I hope you can't hear the dogs chewing in the background, but... (laughs) I will start. And this story happened about uh, five minutes ago. So it's fresh in my brain. I don't have any details that are missing. So I had Ben and Jerry's ice cream in the freezer. Then I just came back from Royals. So I figured might as well drink some Ben and uh, have some Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And I took the lid off, put the lid to the side as you do with ice cream And then when I was done my helping of the ice cream, which wasn't that very much because I wasn't too hungry for ice cream today, um, I couldn't find the lid. And I didn't know where it was. I looked everywhere. And then I could hear in the back and I could hear a... I'm like, oh, it's ginger. And if you follow the sound of ginger, you usually find what you've lost. But only if it's food. And only if it's food that she likes. So if you've lost mayonnaise... If you've lost bread, if you've lost uh, tuna, but not any other kind of fish, Ginger will find it for you and then let you know where it is while also taking a generous serving for herself because she 
It's, she doesn't do it for free. Um, but yeah, that's my story. How if you lose a food item and it's a food item that Ginger likes, just listen for the sounds of her eating it and you'll be able to find it. Uh, Dad, do you have a story? Yeah, I have got a, a story. This weekend, we had a couple guests. Um, it was for a sad reason. I mentioned it in the podcast, actually. But my uncle Murray and my cousin Troy uh, stayed with us just because everybody was in town. And um, we didn't know how the dogs would react to new people or the cat. And uh, they warmed up real quick to these two new people. Adam, if you're still listening, I think Uncle Murray said he likes the cat the most. Yes. Uncle Murray very much liked the cat. When the cat <laughs> yeah. came downstairs, he'd be like, oh, hello. And then the cat would go over to him and go, meow. And he'd yeah. be like, meow. And then he'd go and pet her. He's like, oh, you're so cute. And, and uh, she- he's only had um, Troy. My my cousin has, doesn't have any pets. And my Uncle Murray's only had little teeny tiny dogs. So he was astounded at how big Bunsen was. He couldn't believe how big Bunsen was. And uh, Troy, to get here, rented a Tesla. It was cheaper than a gas car. And Adam got to go drive in the Tesla. So that's very cool. Adam, do you want to share a little bit about your uh, joyride in the Tesla? I actually went as well. So it was sweet. I never actually got to drive the Tesla, um, but it was so cool. It was like Space Mountain. If you've ever been on Space Mountain in Disney World, you know the exact feeling. It goes and it goes and you're stuck to the back of the seat and you feel like you're like being pushed forward by magnets really, really, really hard. And it's crazy because that thing has like the same acceleration going from like 60 to 100 and 100 to 120 kilometers per hour. That's like uh, uh, the same thing as like 30 to 60 miles per hour from like 20 to 30 miles per hour, like the same exact same acceleration, which is so freakish. Like it's, it feels like you're going the same speed the whole way through. And because there's no engine or like, there's no sound of the engine. Like you don't, you don't know how fast you're going. (laughs) I'd be like, Oh yeah, we're going a solid, I don't know, 60 kilometers per hour or like 35 miles per hour. Uh, no, we're going 100 or 60 miles per hour. Um, yeah, that was crazy. And, uh, and Troy gave us a funny story about how he was on the highway and he was wanting to pass someone. And on the highway, it's like, you can go 110, 120. Um, and he was like, okay, I'll pass this person. And then he was like, oh, I might be going like one, one, 140 maximum. He was going 187. Um, and he's like, oh my goodness. Because it can go so fast and it can get fast so fast. And it's crazy. And it, like the whole thing, it's like a spaceship. It's like Space Mountain. It's exactly like Space Mountain. I know. Troy lives in Vancouver. Uh, Troy lives in Vancouver and he knows a whole bunch of like trendy, trendy people. And he's like some of my friends who want a Corvette or have a Corvette. They're, they're looking at the wrong car. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to spend that amount of money on a car, I'd recommend a Tesla. They're crazy cool. <laughs> so yeah so that was it we had some visitors and the dogs really liked the visitors um but definitely my uncle murray liked the cat the most that's my story mom do you have a story i sure do my story involves family time with me adam uh for the last couple of days uh we have got home before jason and to be um, helpful. And because we've got a lot on the go and we've got a, a finite uh, schedule where we have to be able to fit things in. Uh, Adam and I have taken the dogs for a walk ourselves. So today before Royals, um, we went again and uh, we went quickly and Bunsen and Beaker were, were having a great time. And it's funny because Adam runs ahead and Beaker runs at the same pace as him. And she really likes it because she likes to run. And I don't run that well anymore. And, but Adam likes to run. And so she can have fun frolicking in the field as well. Um, Adam ripped out a fence post today. <laughs> and I said, why did you do that? And he just did it. So is it one of the rotten ones, obviously. Okay. There's a little bit of a, 
amendment to my story. Adam kicked the far the Adam kicked the fence post and it fell out of the ground. But and it, all I heard was this big thwack and I was like, "Whoa, what happened up there?" And Bunsen was unconcerned. La la la, undeterred. He just <laughs> he just hung out beside me. Um, but yeah, that's that's my story. Just really getting to spend time with Adam in the wilderness with the dogs. It's been super awesome. All right, so I believe that is it for story time today. Thank you so much for listening to my section of the podcast. And thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Um, yeah, I'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye. That's the end of another Science Podcast episode. Thanks for coming back week after week to listen to our show. Special thanks to our guest, Dr. Derek Miller, who talked to us about improving lab coats and LEDs. We'd also like to give a shout out to our top tier members on the Paw Pack Plus. Stay tuned for details about how you could sign up. Take it away, Chris. Elizabeth Bourgeois, Peggy McKeel, Mary LaMagna Ryder, Helen Chin, Holly Burge, Sandy Brimer, Brenda Clark, Andrew Lynn, Marianne McNally, Karen Beth St. George, Catherine Jordan, Tracy Domingu, Diane Allen, Julie Smith, Terry Adam, Shelley Smith, Jennifer Smathers, Laura Stephenson, Tracy Leanbaugh, Courtney Proven, Fun Lisa, Ben Rathert, Jody Ogren, Brianne Haas, Bianca Hyde, Debbie Anderson, and Uchida. Donna Craig, Amy C., Susan Wagner, Kathy Zerker, and Liz Button. For science, empathy, and cuteness. Uh.